Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and beliefs to help you, God? Let the record show that the witness has answered in the affirmative. Thank you, and please be seated. Director Ray, you may begin. Thank Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Jordan, members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to talk about the FBI's enduring efforts to keep the American people safe. As you know, over our almost 113-year history, the FBI has worked tirelessly alongside our trusted partners to confront a host of threats facing our country, from the persistent threat posed by terrorists, both foreign and domestic, to the counterintelligence threat posed by the governments of aggressive adversaries like China and Russia, to the scourge of violence threatening our neighborhoods, to the rising and evolving threat posed by cyber criminals who seek to hold hostage our companies and our critical infrastructure. I suspect we'll be covering these and other topics today, but I'd like to start by discussing an issue that is of utmost concern to me, to you, and to all Americans, which is the prevalence of violence in our country. Over the last few years, we've witnessed the troubling phenomenon of people resorting to violence and destruction of property to further their ideological, political, or social goals. Far too often, far too often, we're seeing individuals inspired by one or more extremist ideologies to commit criminal acts against their fellow Americans. Now, the FBI does not and should not police ideology, and we do not investigate groups or individuals based on the exercise of First Amendment protected activity alone. But when we encounter violence and threats to public safety, the FBI will not hesitate to take appropriate action. That is not a controversial issue that should force anyone to take sides. We can all agree that violence in any form in support of any set of beliefs cannot and will not be tolerated because violence undermines one of the most basic freedoms of all Americans, the right to feel safe and secure in our own homes and communities. We saw this kind of extremist violence on January 6th when an angry mob used violence and the destruction of property to break into the U.S. Capitol in a failed attempt to undermine our institutions of government and our democratic process. An assault where you, the members of Congress, were victims, but where all Americans were victimized and more than 100 law enforcement officers were injured in just a few hours. Through the dogged work of FBI agents, analysts and professionals working alongside federal, state, and local partners, we've been able to make close to 500 arrests so far, with more sure to come. We also saw extremist violence during last summer's civil unrest. And although most citizens made their voices heard through peaceful, lawful protests, others, far too many, persistently exploited those protests to pursue violent, extremist agendas. In Portland alone, hundreds of law enforcement officers sustained injuries and damage to federal buildings was estimated in the millions of dollars. Across the country, federal, state, and local authorities arrested thousands of individuals who committed criminal acts surrounding those protests. And nearly every one of the FBI's 56 field offices opened investigations amounting to hundreds of investigations involving violent and destructive conduct. More recently, we've seen an alarming increase in hate crimes across the country, many targeting members of the Asian American Pacific Islander and Jewish communities. In some cases, these crimes are carried out by individuals we characterize as racially and ethnically motivated violent extremists. To confront this threat, we've taken a multi-pronged approach focusing on our traditional investigative efforts through our civil rights program, and our domestic terrorism hate crimes fusion cell that we created about a year and a half ago, but also enhancing our law enforcement training, public outreach, and support to our state and local partners. Our efforts to stem extremist violence are on top of our continued and extensive work to disrupt violent gangs, drug organizations, and human traffickers whose criminal acts devastate families and communities. For many of you, Violent crime remains 
the most significant and most pernicious threat you face in your home district. And in difficult times like these, we must never forget the extraordinary bravery of our federal, state, local, and tribal law enforcement members who risk life and safety every single day to protect the public and keep the peace. And I say that because over the past year, we've seen a troubling uptick in violence against members of the law enforcement community. In just the first five months of 2021, 36 officers have been feloniously killed on the job. That's far surpassing the number by this time last year. To put that in perspective, that's almost two law enforcement officers shot and killed every week. And that's not counting all those officers who've died in the line of duty facing the countless other inherent dangers of the job, like racing in pursuit of a suspect and dying in a car accident or drowning in an attempted rescue, or even the scores of officers who've died from COVID-19 because law enforcement of course, kept coming to work every day, right through the teeth of the pandemic. Nor is it counting all those officers who've been badly injured, but thankfully survived, but whose lives and whose families' lives have been forever changed. Now, the loss of any agent or officer is heartbreaking for their families, for their departments, for their communities that they serve. We in the FBI know that all too well with the terrible terrible loss of Special Agents Laura Schwarzenberger and Dan Alfin this past February, shot and killed down near Miami. Each one of the officers and agents we've lost this year were people who got up one morning, picked up their badge, not knowing whether they'd make it home that night. And they did their jobs despite all the hardships they have faced in this almost epically difficult year because they were devoted to protecting their fellow Americans, both friends and strangers alike. And we owe these dedicated public servants a debt of gratitude. More than that, we owe them our best efforts to help stem the tide of violence. All of us here today have a shared responsibility to take a stand, to protect our communities, to support those who serve in law enforcement, and to condemn violence regardless of its motivation. And we in the FBI are ready to do that exactly, to use all the tools at our disposal to uphold the rule of law and to fill our mission to protect every American. Because there is simply no place in this country for hatred, intolerance, or violence, regardless of its motivation, ideology, or otherwise. So thank you for taking the time to hear from me today. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you for your testimony. Christopher Ray was uh, fr flat out lying right there. And the, and the fact is, uh, he is an incompetent director. He was not qualified for this job. I think I'm you know, a huge Trump supporter, but I think it was one of the biggest mistakes uh, of the Trump presidency was putting Christopher Ray in there. And uh, I think he showed it, especially in this, his opening remarks that he made today, how biased he actually is. Because everything that he said, especially about extremist violence, was completely sided to the left. Everything that had to do with any type of group that calls themselves patriots or anything that happened on January 6th was noted and, and displayed by his language as something that is far extreme with very little, if any, people that were there that, to be peaceful. And he made it sound as though the left is mostly peaceful with just a few things. Everything that comes out of this guy's mouth is pushed to the left, but it's subtle. So if you've been you know, a prosecutor or a, a U.S. attorney, or if you've been in the FBI and you listen to his language, you can literally see this. And I, I, I think some of these congressmen and congresswomen actually saw this today, and I think they went after him, but he's not going to bend as far as that goes. I will tell you that I have spoken directly to FBI agents that are investigating January 6th, you know, um, issues, and ranging from individuals that uh, were in the Capitol to individuals who were not in the Capitol. One, one thing that stands out, the, the, the most recent conversation I had with an FBI, FBI agent here in Salt Lake indicated he said he's never seen anything like this. They are given a mandate. They are to go out. They have been given the questions they're supposed to be asking. They have been given the way they're supposed to proceed on this case. They don't have individualized authority. It is all coming from Washington, D.C. I've spoken to prosecutors that are prosecuting these cases. 
And this is not individualized justice. They are lumping everybody into the same category and they are treating them uh, like, unlike I've ever seen in a case. Uh, the Department of Justice is supposed to address every single case, unless it's a conspiracy case, according to the criminal conduct of that individual. They're not doing that. None of the prosecutors mm. have authority. It's all coming straight from Washington, D.C. There is so much energy put towards these people, and there's not the same energy put towards Antifa. Why didn't he explain that? Why couldn't he explain that? Well, I don't think he could explain it because, again, he was making this into uh, more of a political uh, stand. And, you know, he, he said there were three categories of people on January 6th. He failed to completely mention the people who were literally invited into uh, the Capitol building by the, the Capitol Police. And the majority of the people that were there did nothing. It, he made it sound as though if you came on the Capitol grounds, you were an extremist. And that is just not the case. There were some violent people there. There were some people that went into the Capitol that did some very nefarious things. But his category, uh, the way he categorized these people was absolutely wrong. And the way that the FBI has systematically, as uh, Brett just uh, pointed out there, been told how to investigate January 6th, they've systematically been kept from truly investigating or going after the leftists. And that is so clear because of the way that there's just nothing going down about these individuals on the left. And I'll, I'll just say one other thing. In all my time in the FBI, the only white supremacist case that I ever saw, and I was in New York the entire time, was prison related. There was no white supremacy, uh, massive uh, agenda going on in the United States, and it's not happening now. And it's another example of how they use these things and push them out in the media. When you think about what Antifa did last summer, the number of federal properties that they destroyed um, or defaced, and the money that they caused to small businesses, the, the, the police officers who they injured, the Secret Service members, they really haven't been held accountable to the same type of behavior that they did all last summer. Why not? They have not been. I mean, you think about what domestic terrorism is. When you burn down a police station and you take over city blocks, that's domestic terrorism. And they have not been held accountable. Uh, I'm ashamed to, to say that, you know, my, my former office, you know, the Department of Justice, I, I wish I could see courage. I wish I, I could see U.S. attorneys standing up. You know, it's interesting. I, I represent an individual who... Um, went into the Capitol, um, was told she could go in, and was actually pointed by a security guard to the direction she should go. And she's being prosecuted. She's being charged with uh, misdemeanors. She, she has no criminal history. She thought the only other Capitol she's ever been in is a state Capitol that's open 24-7. She thought you could walk in. She, so there's a, there's a wide disparity a, a, between, you know, who Chris Ray is identifying and they want to prosecute every single person that was there to send a message. And that's what this is. It's message prosecuting. And, and, and that's mm -hmm. never a, a, an appropriate decision by a prosecutor.